Will he always call upon God? Job 27 verse 10. Concerning these words, I would observe who it is that is here spoken of, namely the hypocrite. As you may see, if you take the two preceding verses with a verse of the text, for what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he is gained, when God takes away his soul, will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? Job's three friends in their speeches to him insisted much upon it that he was a hypocrite. But Job, in this chapter, asserts his sincerity and integrity and shows how different his own behavior had been from that of hypocrites. Particularly, he declares his steadfast and immovable resolution of persevering and holding out in the ways of religion and righteousness to the end. And, as you may see in the six first verses, in the text he shows how contrary to the steadfastness and perseverance the character of the hypocrite is, who is not likely thus to hold out in religion. Number two, we may observe what duty of religion it is with respect to which the hypocrite is deciphered in the text, and that is his duty of prayer, or calling upon God. Number three, here is something supposed of the hypocrite relating to this duty, namely that he may continue in it for a while, may call upon God for a season. Wherefore, something asserted, namely, that it is not the manner of hypocrites to continue always in this duty. Will he always call upon God? It is in the form of an interrogation. But the words have the force of a strong assertion, that however the hypocrite may call upon God for a season, Yet, he will not always continue in it. Doctrine However hypocrites may continue for a season in the duty of prayer, yet it is their manner after a while in a great measure to leave off. In speaking upon this doctrine, I shall show first how hypocrites often continue for a season to call upon God. Secondly, how it is their manner after a while in a great measure to leave off the practice of this duty. Thirdly, give some reasons why this is a manner of hypocrites. First, I would show how hypocrites often continue for a season in the duty of prayer. They do so for a while after they have received common illuminations and affections. While they are under awakenings, they may through fear of hell call upon God and attend very constantly upon the duty of secret prayer. And after they have had some melting affections, having their hearts much moved with the goodness of God, or with some affecting encouragements and false joy and comfort, while these impressions last, they continue to call upon God in the duty of secret prayer. Number two, after they have obtained a hope and have made profession of their good estate, they often continue for a while in the duty of secret prayer. For a while, they are affected with their hope. They think that God has delivered them out of a natural condition and given them an interest in Christ, thus introducing them into a state of safety from that eternal misery which they lately feared. With this supposed kindness of God to them, they are much affected, and often find in themselves for a while a kind of love to God, excited by His supposed love to them. Now, while this affection towards God continues, the duties of religion seem pleasant to them. It is even with some delight that they approach to God in their closets. And for the present it may be, they think of no other than continuing to call upon God as long as they live. Yea, they may continue in a duty of secret prayer for a while, after the liveliness of their affections is past through the influence of their former intentions. They intended to continue seeking God always, and now suddenly to leave off would be too shocking to their own minds. And the force of their own preconceived notions, that is, that godly persons continue in religion, may have some effect. Therefore, though they have no love to the duty of prayer, and begin to grow weary of it, Yet, as they love their own false hope, 
they're somewhat backward to take a course which will prove it to be a false hope and so deprive them of it. If they should all at once bear the sign of a false hope, they would scare themselves. Their hope is dear to them, and it would frighten them to see any plain evidence that it is not true. Hence, for a considerable time after the force of their illuminations and affections is over, and after they hate the duty of prayer, and would be glad to have done with it, if they could without showing themselves to be hypocrites, they hold up a kind of attendance upon the duty of secret prayer. This may keep up the outside of religion in them for a good while, and occasion it to be somewhat slowly that they are brought to neglect it. They must not leave off suddenly, because that would be too great a shock to their false peace, but they must come gradually to it, as they find their consciences can bear it, and as they can find out devices and salvos to cover the matter, and make their so doing consistent, in their own opinion, with the truth of their hope. But, secondly, it is the manner of hypocrites after a while in a great measure to leave off the practice of this duty. We are often taught that the seeming goodness and piety of hypocrites is not of a lasting and persevering nature. It is so with respect to their practice of the duty of prayer in particular, and especially of secret prayer. They can omit this duty and their omission of it not be taken notice of by others who know what profession they have made, so that a regard to their own reputation obliges them still to practice it. If others saw how they neglect it, it would exceedingly shock their charity towards them, but their neglect does not fall under their observation, at least not under the observation of many. Therefore they may omit this duty, and still have the credit of being converted persons. Men of this character can come to neglect of secret prayer by degrees, without shocking their peace. For though indeed for a converted person to live in a great measure without secret prayer is very wide of the notion they once had of a true convert, yet they find means by degrees to alter their notions and to bring their principles to suit with their inclinations. And at length they come to a notion that a man may be a convert, and yet live very much in neglect of this duty. In time... They can bring all things to suit well together, as a hope of heaven, an indulgence of spiritual sloth, gratifying carnal appetites, and living in a great measure a prayerless life. They cannot indeed suddenly make these things agree. It must be a work of time, and length of time will effect it. By degrees they find out ways to guard and defend their consciences against those powerful enemies, so that those enemies and a quiet, secure conscience can at length dwell together. Whereas it is asserted in the doctrine that it is a manner of hypocrites after a while and a great measure to leap off this duty, I would observe to you that it is not intended but that they may commonly continue to the end of life in an external attendance on prayer with others. They may commonly be present at public prayers in the congregation, and also at family prayer. This and such places of light as this is men commonly do before they are so much as awakened. Many vicious persons who make no pretense to serious religion commonly attend public prayers in the congregation and also more private prayers in the families in which they live. Unless it be when carnal designs interfere, or when their youthful pleasures and diversions and their vain company call them, and then they make no conscience of attending family prayer. Otherwise, they may continue to attend upon prayer as long as they live, and yet may truly be said not to call upon God. For such prayer in the manner of it is not their own. They are present only for the sake of their credit, or in compliance with others. They may be present at these prayers, and yet have no proper prayer of their own. Many of those concerning whom it may be said, as in Job 15, verse 4, did they cast off fear and restrain prayer before God, 
are yet frequently present in family and public prayers. But do in a great measure leap off the practice of secret prayer. They come to this by degrees. At first they begin to be careless about it, under some particular temptations, because they have been out in their young company or have been taken up very much with worldly business. They omit it once. After that they more easily omit it again. Thus it presently becomes a frequent thing with them to omit it. And after a while it comes to that pass that they seldom attend it. Perhaps they attend it on Sabbath days, and sometimes on other days. But they have ceased to make it a constant practice daily to retire to worship God alone, and to seek His face in secret places. They sometimes do a little to quiet the conscience, and just to keep alive their old hope, because it would be shocking to them even after all their subtle dealing with their consciences to call themselves converts, and yet totally to live without prayer. Yet to practice the secret prayer they have in a great measure left off. I come now, thirdly, to the reasons why this is a manner of hypocrites. 1. Hypocrites never had the spirit of prayer. They may have been stirred up to the external performance of this duty and that with a great deal of earnestness and affection, and yet always have been destitute of the true spirit of prayer. The spirit of prayer is a holy spirit, a gracious spirit. We read of the spirit of grace and supplication in Zechariah 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications. Wherever there is a true spirit of supplication, there is a spirit of grace. The true spirit of prayer is no other than God's own spirit dwelling in the hearts of the saints. And as this spirit comes from God, so it naturally tends to God in holy breathings and pantings. It naturally leads to God to converse with them by prayer. Therefore the Spirit is said to make intercession for the saints with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8 verse 26 The Spirit of God makes intercession for them, as it is that Spirit which in some respect indicts their prayers and leads them to pour out their souls before God. Therefore the saints are said to worship God in the Spirit. Philippians 3 verse 3 We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. In John 4, verse 23, the true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The truly godly have the spirit of adoption, the spirit of a child, to which it is natural to go to God and call upon him, crying to him as to a father. But hypocrites have nothing of the spirit of adoption. They don't have the spirit of children. For this is a gracious and holy spirit given only in a real work of regeneration. Therefore, it is often mentioned as a part of the distinguishing character of the godly, that they call upon God, Psalm 145, verses 18 and 19. The Lord is nigh to them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. Joel 2, verse 32. It shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is natural to one who is truly born from above to pray to God and pour out his soul in holy supplications before his heavenly Father. This is as natural to the new nature and life as breathing is to the nature and life of the body. But hypocrites have not this new nature. Those illuminations and affections which they have had went away and left no change of nature. Therefore prayer naturally dies away in them, having no foundation laid in the nature of the soul. It is maintained a while only by a certain force put upon nature. But force is not constant. And as that declines, nature will take place again. The spirit of a true convert is the spirit of true love to God. And that naturally inclines a soul to those duties wherein it is conversant with God. 
and makes it to delight in approaching him. But a hypocrite has no such spirit. He is left under the reigning power of enmity against God, which naturally inclines him to shun his presence. The spirit of a true convert is the spirit of faith and reliance on the power, wisdom, and mercy of God, and such a spirit is naturally expressed in prayer. True prayer is nothing else but faith expressed. Hence we read of the prayer of faith, James 5, verse 15. True Christian prayer is the faith and reliance of the soul breathed forth in words. But a hypocrite is without the spirit of faith. He has no true reliance or dependence on God, but is really self-dependent. As to those common convictions and affections which the hypocrite had, and which made him keep up the duty of prayer for a while, they not reaching the bottom of the heart, nor being accompanied with any change of nature, a little thing extinguishes them. The cares of the world commonly choke and suffocate them, and often the pleasures and vanities of youth totally put an end to them, and with them ends their constant practice of the duty of prayer. When a hypocrite has had his false conversion, his wants are in his sense of things already supplied. His desires are already answered, so he finds no further business at the throne of grace. He never was sensible that he had any other needs but a need of being saved from hell. And now that he is converted, as he thinks, that need is supplied. Why then should he still go on to resort to the throne of grace with earnest requests? He is out of danger. All that he was afraid of is removed. He's got enough to carry him to heaven, and what more should he desire? While under awakenings he had this to stir him up to go to God in prayer that he was in continual fear of hell. This put him upon crying to God for mercy. But since in his own opinion he is converted, he has no further business about which to go to God. And although he may keep up the duty of prayer in the outward form a little while, for fear of spoiling his hope, yet he will find it a dull business to continue in it without necessity. And so by degrees he will drop the practice. The work of the hypocrite is done when he is converted, and therefore he stands in no further need of help. But it is far otherwise with the true convert. His work is not done, but he finds still a great work to do, and great wants to be supplied. He sees himself still to be a poor, empty, helpless creature, and that he still stands in great and continual need of God's help. He is sensible that without God he can do nothing. A false conversion makes a man in his own eyes self-sufficient. He says he is rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing, and knows not that he is wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. But after a true conversion, the soul remains sensible of its own impotence and emptiness as it is in itself, and its sense of it is rather increased than diminished. It is still sensible of its universal dependence on God for everything. A true convert is sensible that his grace is very imperfect, and he is very far from having all that he desires. Instead of that... By conversion are begotten in him new desires which he never had before. He now finds in him holy appetites, a hungering and thirsting after righteousness, a longing after more acquaintance and communion with God, so that he has business enough still at the throne of grace. Yea, his business there, instead of being diminished, is rather increased. The hope which the hypocrite has of his good estate takes off the force that the command of God before had upon his conscience, so that he now dares neglect so plain a duty. The command which requires a practice of the duty of prayer is exceeding plain, Matthew 26, verse 41, Watch and pray, that you enter not into temptation. Ephesians 6, verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit 
and watcheth thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for, for all saints. Matthew 6, verse 6, When you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut your door, pray to the Father which is in secret. As long as a hypocrite was, in his own apprehension, in continual danger of hell, he dared not disobey these commands. But since he is, as he thinks, safe from hell, he has grown bold. He dares to live in the neglect of the plainest command in the Bible. Number four, it is a manner of hypocrites after a while to return to sinful practices which will tend to keep them from praying. While they were under convictions, they reformed their lives and walked very exactly. This reformation continues after their supposed conversion, while they are much affected with a hope and a false comfort. But as these things die away, their old lusts revive, and by degrees they return like the dog to his vomit, and a soul that was washed who were wallowing in the mire. They return to their sensual, worldly, proud, and contentious practices as before, and no wonder this makes them forsake their closets. Sinning and praying don't agree well together. If a man be constant in the duty of secret prayer, it will tend to restrain him from willful sinning. So, on the other hand, if he allows himself in sinful practices, it will restrain him from praying. It will give quite another turn to his mind, so that he will have no disposition to the practice of such a duty. It will be contrary to him. A man who knows that he lives in sin against God will not be inclined to come daily into the presence of God but will rather be inclined to fly from his presence, as Adam, when he had eaten of the forbidden fruit, ran away from God and hid himself among the trees of the garden. To keep up the duty of prayer after he has given loose to his lusts would tend very much to disquiet a man's conscience, would give advantage to his conscience to testify aloud against him. If he should come from his wickedness into the presence of God immediately to speak to him, his conscience would, as it were, fly in his face. Therefore, hypocrites, as they by degrees admit their wicked practices, exclude prayer. Number five, hypocrites never counted the cost of perseverance in seeking God and of following him to the end of life. To continue instant in prayer with all perseverance to the end of life requires much care watchfulness, and labor, for much opposition is made to it by the flesh, the world, and the devil, and Christians meet with many temptations to forsake this practice. He that would persevere in his duty must be laborious in religion in general, but hypocrites never count the cost of such labor. In other words, they never were prepared in the disposition of their minds to give their lives to the service of God and to the duties of religion. It is, therefore, no great wonder they are weary and give up, after they have continued for a while, as their affections are gone. They find that prayer to them grows irksome and tedious. Number six, hypocrites have no interest in those gracious promises which God has made to his people, of those spiritual supplies which are needful in order to uphold them in the way of their duty to the end. God has promised to true saints that they shall not forsake him. Jeremiah 32, verse 40. I will put my fear into their hearts, that they shall not depart from me. He has promised that he will keep them in the way of their duty. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. And a God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it. But hypocrites have no interest in these and such like promises, and therefore are liable to fall away. If God does not uphold men, there is no dependence on their steadfastness. If the Spirit of God depart from them, they will soon become careless and profane, and there will be an end to their seeming devotion and piety. Application the application may be in a use of exhortation in two branches. One I would exhort those who have entertained the hope of their being true converts and who since their supposed conversion have left off the duty of secret prayer 
and ordinarily allow themselves in the omission of it to throw away their hope. If you have left off calling upon God, it is time for you to leave off hoping and flattering yourselves with an imagination that you are the children of God. Probably it will be a very difficult thing for you to do this. It is hard for a man to let go a hope of heaven on which he has once allowed himself to lay hold of, and which he has retained for a considerable time. True conversion is a rare thing. But that men should be brought off from a false hope of conversion after they are once settled and established in it, and have continued in it for some time, is much more rare. Though things in men which, if known, would be sufficient to convince others that they are hypocrites, will not convince themselves. And though things which would be sufficient to convince them concerning others, will not be sufficient to convince them concerning themselves. They can make larger allowances for themselves than they can for others. They can find out ways to solve objections against their own hope, when they can find none in the like case for their neighbor. But, if your case be such as is spoken of in the doctrine, it is surely time for you to seek a better hope, and another work of God's Spirit, than ever you have yet experienced something more thorough and effectual. When you find by experience that the seed which was sown in your hearts, though at first sprang up and seemed flourishing, is withering away, as by the heat of the sun, or is choked, as with thorns, that shows in what sort of ground the seed was sown, that it is either stony or thorny ground, and that therefore it is necessary you should pass through another change, in which your heart may become good ground, which will bring forth fruit with patience. Don't insist on that as a reason why you should not throw away your hope that you had the judgment of others, that the change of which you were the subject was right. It is a small manner to be judged of man's judgment, whether you are approved or condemned and whether it be a pastor or people, wise or unwise, 1 Corinthians 4, 3, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. If your goodness is proved to be as a morning cloud and early dew, if you be one of those who have forsaken God and left off calling upon his name, you have the judgment and sentence of God in the scriptures against you which is a thousand times more than to have the judgment of all the wise and godly men and pastors in the world in your favor. Others, from your account of things, may have been obliged to have charity for you, and to think that, provided you were not mistaken, and your account did not misrepresent things or express them by wrong terms, you were really converted. But what a miserable foundation is this, upon which to build a hope as to your eternal state. Here I request your attention to a few things in particular, which I have to say to you concerning your hope. Why will you retain that hope which by evident experience you find poisons you? Is it reasonable to think that a holy hope, a hope that is from heaven, would have such an influence? No, surely. Nothing of such a malignant influence comes from that world of purity and glory. No poison grows in the paradise of God. The same hope which leads men to sin in this world will lead to hell hereafter. Why, therefore, will you retain such a hope of which your own experience shows you the ill tendency and that encourages you to lead a wicked life? For certainly that life is a wicked life in which you live in the neglect of so well known a duty as that of secret prayer, and in the disobedience of so plain a command of God as that by which the duty is enjoined. And is not a way of disobedience to God a way to hell? If your own experience of the nature and tendency of your hope will not convince you of the falseness of it, what will? Are you resolved to retain your hope? Let it prove ever so unsound and hurtful. Will you hold it at fast till you go to hell with it? 
many men cling to a false hope and embrace it so closely that they never let it go until the flames of hell cause their arms to unclench and let go their hold. Consider how you will answer it at the day of judgment, when God shall call you to an account for your folly in resting in such a hope. Will it be a sufficient answer for you to say that you had the charity of others, and that they thought your conversion was right? Certainly it is foolish for men to imagine that God had no more wisdom, or could contrive no other way of bestowing comfort and hope of eternal life than one which should encourage men to forsake him.